Hey guys, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program. My name is Twitchy, and last time we stuck Kerbals on the moon and reached out towards Minmus with our technological grass to ensnare it for future studies. This time I bring you transforming planes, tails used as nose cones, docking without the use of an RCS system, and sending Jeb out of the Kerbal system. Once again, my name is Twitchy, and welcome to my final career. Did I say transforming planes? Well, yes, indeed, for I have a very specific problem that I need to address. But first, let's watch this wonderful takeoff flown today by Jebediah Kerman. For those of you that have been watching my series for a little bit of time, you might be surprised by this choice of pilot. Don't worry, well, he's literally done this type of flight before. He is a bus driver. The very specific problem that I have at this moment in time is that I have a few tourist destinations or a few tourists wanting to go to destinations that are not immediately above my rocket launch pad. This is quite inconvenient as you can imagine and so I need to move my rocket to a launch site that is further away and I think the best way to do that is strap some wings that are removable to my rocket isn't this amazing this monstrosity is called the tourist trap it is the result of the development cycle that we did at the end of a last episode turns out that the decouplers were the missing piece of that technology throwing away the airbound equipment to launch ourselves and propel hello Kerman out of the atmosphere. We are just a capsule and some wings at the moment, trying to balance the rocket so that we can have the wings up the front there was quite awkward, but nothing that wasn't beyond my capabilities. At this point, both the game and Hell are like, thank you, you got me over the destination I wanted to go to, thanks very much. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's all and all, but we've got you up here, let's give the craft a little bit of a spin. I would be a little bit annoyed if I paid to go and have a look at something and all I could see was the horizon several hundred kilometers off to the east, west, north, and south. I want to see the thing underneath me, the thing I have paid to go and look at. And it also uh, adds a little splash of self-promotion now for my twitchy flag being up on screen at that point. That's, that's beautiful, I like that. A uh, lot. Change of camera angle to watch Hell All there. Enjoy the centrifugal force imparted on her body. Is it the equal across her body? I, I'm not sure what's going on there. Like, I think her head's in the middle and then her feet come down to the edge, but maybe the very top of her head is up, up, up on the other side. So maybe she has two different gravity fields of pulling on her head and her feet. This might be slightly uncomfortable. I, I am not sure. I think we should probably do some experiments at some point to uh, see how much Kerbals can withstand of that. Impervious. Hello there, seems to be enjoying herself. I've got to say, on the way up to Apple Apps, she didn't really look like she was enjoying that much, but once we crested over the top of the arc and started falling down, you could not wipe the smile off her face. But even though she would have been in micro Gs during that whole experience, uh, anything that's just in free flight, no forces acted upon it, will of course be in free fall. That's, that's kind of where the name comes from, right? We have time for one last stunning vista to take in before we come crashing down into the atmosphere. We're about 100 kilometers up right now, and that means we're gonna take a little bit of preparation time to make sure that we are wings are level coming into the atmosphere. We are trying to slow down as much as possible, and if we face directly down, we are not gonna do that. Our Kerbals have passed out from the G-forces involved. If we were past pointing down, the aerodynamic shape of this craft would have mean we would have ended up plummeting into the floor at several times the speed of a sound because the atmosphere would not have had time to slow us down in time but actually what happened is we pulled up so hard using the control authorities of the wing that not only did our passenger pass out which I was kind of expected during our flight profile but also Jebediah passed out this was not expected and thankfully we had enough time to wait for him to wake back up before we could take back control and, and it all worked out well in the end we're not going to mention to the client what exactly happened there with our mercantile impulses taken care of, of course we are saving up for the ability to upgrade our VRB and our space plane hangar. We have some progression to take care of. We need to get ourselves up and into orbit and dock with another craft. We have unlocked the abilities to have the Clampatron docking ports. It turns out actually not the full size ones. I thought I did actually have them, but you need to upgrade your R&D center one more to be able to get the technology for the full size Clampatron docking clamps. Uh, so we're gonna have to make do with the little ones here. As this vessel's itinerary 
binary is nice and sure. We've not bothered attaching any serious signs to this. All it needs to do is go up to a fairly tight orbit and meet itself. So to that end, all we've done is attach some lights up top and we start building the booster already. On stream, we were surprised to see the updated Swivel and Reliant models there. They're looking pretty good. Bit chonky on the connection to the fuel tanks, but you know, that's cool. We've got ourselves a liquid fuel center there with the Swivel engine on the bottom. Uh, we're going to put some hammers around the outside and some fins for stability and looking for some nose cones to keep us nice and aerodynamic going through the atmosphere and I thought yes why not let's put these uh, these tail pieces in place it made uh, chat groan so I was uh, well away with it chat provided the name for this craft couples therapy one we're going to bring couples therapy two with us as well Valentina taking the helm going up pretty steep this time this wasn't really the plan uh, when I was taking off but it was the profile that we got stuck with so rather than risk spinning out I carried on with it we did have uh, some pretty serious spins on the bottom so we probably could have taken some pretty serious corrective measures and not had to deal with it too much but we just pushed our apple apps up to 75 kilometers and started our main drift on the way up there it's a nice easy way to get ourselves a nice easy orbit i do like the easy parts of this game after all but maybe it's that level of complacency that leads me to subpar orbital profiles, such as the one we've had bringing up through the atmosphere, and indeed one that we are about to run into. I, I think that we are plenty ahead of our Apple Apsis, but it turns out, no, the single swivel engine does not have as much power as I would like to have at the bottom of a stack the size that it is, and so we are on our way back down into the atmosphere before we actually manage to get enough forward velocity to secure ourselves something that the game considers to be an orbit. The problem with that is that our periapsis currently Currently down at 47 kilometers into the atmosphere so I burn it radially upwards to bring that periaps towards us we are still 60 kilometers in the app well we're 10 kilometers in the atmosphere 60 kilometers off the floor what I do is bring my Apple apps down to about the height that I wanted to have it at anyway 75 kilometers will do quite nicely and then time warp my, warp my way out of the atmosphere this actually takes a little bit of time because obviously in the atmosphere you're not allowed to use proper time warp we're only allowed to have physics time warp and the maximum that can be is four times gives us some plenty of opportunities to look at the wonderful coastline and rolling down underneath us but when the time has come we've managed to warp our way up to our apple apps and we're just going to spend a tiny tiny amount of delta v circularizing the orbit in to the couples of therapy two now the chat has asked me to put the kerbal engineer on so that they can pay attention to some of the numbers at the top of the screen i am more than willing to do that i want to try and make it integrate into the system a little bit better and that's the best i can do i suppose that will be fine a quick name change and we are ready to go oh one more thing we have a new kerbal to welcome to the group i'd like you guys to welcome jess moore kerman jess moore has come to us from kerbin city university of course she has and her first mission here is to be an orbital target for valentina to come and dock to her pitch maneuver is a little bit wobbly but all she needs to do is put herself into a nice orbit and to do that all she needs to do is follow the suggested markers on her nav ball and while she's doing that i would like to take a moment to thank every single one of my patrons you can see their name rolling up the screen right now and these are the guys and girls that will keep me focused and recording videos when my friends come to me and be like twitchy my friend do we want to go to monaco and knock over the monte carlo casino we've got an elaborate plan involving you and a small band of circus performers i'm gonna have to be like my friends i'm sorry but i cannot i have videos to make so i'm sure you guys can help me in saying thank you very much to these people keeping my pc powered and food in my mouth uh, is the best way of surviving forward believe Either you, me. Anyway, in the background there, I am currently in the process of uh, trying to rendezvous my two vessels together. When I launched this craft, I was fully expecting Jess Moore here to be the static target and to take Valentina to be the one to go and dock. But no, no, whilst I am flying Jess Moore, let's carry on doing the docking with Jess Moore. The reason for this change of plan is all to do with the relative orientation of these craft when I launch the second one. I like to make sure that the craft that I'm aiming for, the target vessel, if you will, is passing over the top of the desert when I launch the secondary vessel, the rendezvousing vessel. Rendezvousing a, a word? I feel like it's not really a word. But anyway, because of this, it means that when I am getting ready for my circularization burn, quite often the target vessel will be passing relatively close to me. And if I feel like it's incredibly close, I will change my navigation systems to the target mode and I will use that to not circularize my orbit, but to make my relative speed and velocity the same as my target vessel, which also happens 
happens to have the effect of giving me a perfect orbit. <laughs> That's as long as the target vessel is in a decent orbit. Obviously, if the target vessel is just about to crash and I make my heading and trajectory the same as the target vessel, well, then it's just going to be a bad news all round. Once I had used the intersect nodes to try and get my orbits within 10 kilometers of each other, uh, we got close, very close indeed, and started using the navball for navigation. Now, the standard way of rendezvousing like this is to use your retrograde target marker to completely cancel out the speed between you and the target vessel and then burn towards the pink marker because that is where your target vessel is located. And as you go round the circle of the orbit, that will uh, slowly drift and change. I am using a slightly different version where I am burning left and right of the yellow circles to push them on top of the pink ones. And this way uh, I am keeping our orbits aligned without actually slowing down the speed with which I am approaching. But now that we've actually got close enough, it is time to shed our booster stage. I probably should have done it where it was going to drop into uh, the atmosphere, but this was good enough for me. We will go around and pick stuff up with a secondary mission at some point. Uh, going through and setting the blink rate right, I didn't I didn't like the green. If I was to be honest with you, I didn't like the color of green that the preset gave us, so I gave it a little bit of a tweak just to, uh, just, to, just to please me a little bit more. Right now, I am trying to get my sp target speed down to as low as possible so that we can time warp our way around to the lit side of the planet. Every time that I try and do a rendezvous like this, I always seem to end up on the night side of the planet. I am not about trying to do those types of maneuvers in the complete darkness, so I made sure that we were basically not moving relative to each other and then time warped my way around. When we got round to sunrise, I then actually re-zeroed our speed relative to each other so that I could point directly at the target vessel. Of course, docking is going to happen at an agonizingly slow pace when it's just two vessels like this and I have no left or right control. What I need to do is push myself towards my target ever so slowly and then as I'm approaching, go either side of my destination trajectory to move my target left and right and thus end up pointing directly at my target to face the two docking ports together and and come together as one unified vehicle. Taking a look at the map view, I uh, very quickly realized that actually I can get these guys back home in one single burn. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. I set up a maneuver note just so I can be totally sure that we are facing in the right direction. I've got two engines on this thing and who knows if it's gonna end up working the way that I want to. So I wanna try and make sure there are as many safety systems in place as possible. We burn out hard and fast with this one singular engine that is pointing in the correct direction. I had to turn off the other engine just to make sure I didn't end up counteracting its thrust. And now I've taken a moment to check out the linearity of the flashing of these two blinking lights here. Turns out if you do indeed set one at twice the rate of the other, they you get two blinks to one. Uh, it could There was no reason that it had to be that way other than that was the easy way to do it. Uh, I'm then marveling at the ability of mine to dock so absolutely straight with these two crafts with no SAS and very, uh, sorry, no RCS and very little SAS. Uh, and then I was reminded that actually docking ports move now so I've got that absolutely pixel perfect facing each other and then tried some Magnus effect experiments on the way down I thought maybe if we spun up nice and high we can get some sort of drag forces but of course Kerbal Space Program doesn't model drag in the same way that the physical universe models drag, so that unfortunately is an effect that is missing from this particular simulation. But we seem to be doing quite well at coming down within sight of the KSC. Uh, I do always prefer to land as close as possible, but uh, th this was as close as we can handle this time. Uh, it turns out I did not have enough fuel to slow down as much as I wanted to, and, and who knows, maybe the Magnus effect spin actually did impart a little bit of extra velocity forwards for us, maybe a bit of a lift to keep us traveling far forwards. Parachutes open and everybody is safe. But safe is not how we run this space program and safe is not how we impress people. So Jess Moore come and gets out and does a daring display of skills, skydiving her way at least half the distance before opening her parachute and having a little bit of a glide around. I try and keep an eye on the vessel so that we can land somewhere close to each other, but actually the vessel is under the parachute so it seems to be moving around quite a distance. I get Valentina out 
out to do the same and realise that actually she doesn't have a parachute on. A side effect of the trip to the moon. So she just gets inside and uh, tries to spot Jess Moore out there. Turns out she is further away from the vessel than I thought she was. So we time warp our way down to a nice safe landing. Recover everybody up and that is a contract complete. Oh yeah. We're going to break the timelines just a little bit and go back to last night. Jebediah has another mission to perform, another mission that goes out all the way to the impact crater on the other side of Kerbin. I'm sure you guys have seen it before. If not, here's a little bit of video. Look at it there. Isn't it brilliant? Okay, so these guys want to go over there. And what's the? why is this different? Why am I even showing you? Well, this is actually outside the range of our jet engines there. This craft can go all the way to the other side of the desert and, in fact, has got enough fuel to carry on going past the desert. At the edge of the desert, it's got about half its fuel tanks going on, but this isn't actually at the craters yet. As we get up to the wall of the crater, you can see that our fuel is running desperately low. So low, in fact, that I decide now is the time to fire our solid boosters. I keep calling them solid boosters, but of course that main thumper in the middle there is our main engine, so uh, to call it a booster is not really the way. Today we at Twitchy Tours are taking Jamie and Munlin Kerman off on an adventure over the impact crater. These two brothers were the first to realise the propulsive capabilities of the liquid fuel, and after convincing a whole bunch of local inhabitants to move off their land, thus classifying it as unused, they extracted the resource from that particular area and sold it on to the space programme for massive profit. They then used some of that money to buy their themselves a ticket onto this flight and are seeing the benefits of all their hard work. Re-entry is hotter than the gametes of the original residents at the old mine site. Did you know they found a load of plutonium randomly there? It's amazing how these things turn up. Re-entry not quite as high G as the original flight, obviously where we had to burn sideways to make our target. Not as much velocity went into the upwards direction, so we were coming at a much more shallow angle, giving the atmosphere a much longer time to act upon the body of this craft, slowing us down to a manageable, manageable level. Getting down to about two kilometers up we pop the parachute and float our way on down to the surface of the liquid that we like to call an ocean and we go and recover them a great great PR mission wonderful Kerbal Space Program has a whole bunch of progression based contracts for you to go and follow along and the next one that we have to do is to go and get some science from the orbit of the sun that's right we need to try and send ourselves something out beyond the sphere of influence of Kerbin to grab ourselves some science from the sun and send it back I believe Squad actually intends for you to send a probe out at this point, to send a, uh, a probe core on top of a rocket with some sort of communication array to send the information back, but I don't think that's the way we're going to do it this time. We're going to send a Kerbal along because Kerbals have the ability to be able to not need battery power. That means if we're sending them out for a very long time and they also manage to somehow find themselves in the very, very depths of the system, way out beyond Jewel, they won't need the solar powers to be able to keep themselves running. At this this point I'm wondering what type of form my vessel should take and I seem to have gone for the two engines on either side of a central pod. This is probably so that I can bring it back via the ability of a really deep atmospheric aero burn. I, I suppose atmospheric and aero was a little bit uh, redundant there but that's that's where we're at. Two reasons contributed to the decision of this particular form factor. One is that I wanted to have the ablative heat shield on the bottom and two that the ablative heat shield would stop fuel flow and I didn't really want it to get like really leggy and long so I wanted to have my fuel tanks around the middle of the mass there and if I put an engine on the bottom the uh, heat shield wouldn't let that roll. I put down a whole bunch of two meter tanks just so that I could put the skipper on the bottom. It is the largest fuel, uh, largest engine we have at the moment but but we have noticed that we are way over mass for the size of our launch pad right now and bringing the amount of solid fuel down it, it does kind of correct it just a little bit. I've noticed that we've got the Easter skins there. I think they're great but we're, we're not going to go with them. Not, not for this particular playthrough. And which can are we going to send to the very outskirts of the Kerbin system? Well, I think there's only really one choice. We've got one Kerbal that we have grown to hate so much that we want to send them as far away as physically possible, and that Kerbal is, of course, Jebediah Kerman. That's right, man. You are, you've trained your entire existence for this day. Three, two, one. 
get on out of here. All right, cool. He is off and on his way. Whilst talking to Stream about whether we're going to be sending him up system or down system, uh, Landstrider asked if I could do a mun assist on the way out. I was like, okay, fine, yeah, we'll, we'll do the mun assist and we'll see which way that ends up kicking us out there. Solid separation went particularly well. And then I've got to be honest with you, this whole flight here, this jaunt on my way up to orbit, kind of kind of went nominally. Uh, nominal is not really the most exciting, but it does get the job done. We're cruising our way out of the top of the atmosphere and with the skipper engine on the back I feel like now is the time just to point ourselves down to the horizon and start circularizing our burn. I want to try and get some orientation, try and figure out where the orientation of Kerbin's orbit is in relation to my orbit, uh, how we're going to exit the system and now how we're going to swing past a MUN assist on the way. Thankfully having a look around I can see that the MUN is on the right hand side and the prograde of Kerbin is towards forwards if you will, the other side of the orbit that I actually currently am. This means that the two, uh, two are actually perfectly lined up with each other. As we all know, going to the Mun, you have about a 90 degree swing clockwise around its orbit to uh, to meet it up, and then using a very little amount of delta V, I'm, allowed, I'm able to radially burn closer and closer to the Mun, getting a greater and greater gravity assist as I do so. We've managed to arrange to have ourselves about a 500 meter per second delta V burn there, or maybe, maybe closer to 60. 600, and that's about the delta V needed to get to the moon because this is actually all we're doing We are uh, accelerating this mass of rocket up to be fast enough that it's going to make its way to the moon To get to Minmus the next target out would cost us something on order of 900 delta V uh, There's there's not only do you, do you have to get up to that sort of altitude But you also have to make a small inclination burn to make sure you get there But still only spending 500 meters per second you can see that we are getting very very close to the Mun or the Mun surface there. In fact, we've gone so close that I'm actually going to end up putting my booster uh, onto a crash course so we don't, so we can keep it all clean. But our trajectory now leaves the Kerbal system. This would cost over a thousand Delta Vs and we've managed to do it in half the expenditure. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. I like it. It's great, great economy. With the trajectory set, the only thing we really need to do now is separate off from our booster. Let that fly on its way to go and clean itself up. We're going to have a periaps of about 10 kilometers. That's from the decoupling force and also the, a little boost with my engine. It really wasn't much. And we're going to watch this uh, this booster come in very, very close to the MUN here. Uh, I always like, if I'm going to blow up a piece of hardware like this, I want to be able to watch it go. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that Kerbal's made for. Isn't, isn't that amazing? Returning to Jeb, I really thought all the debris had been destroyed in that crash, but there it goes careening away at kilometers per second. We've got a tail fin. These things seem to be absolutely indestructible. Doesn't matter how hard you smash into the floor if you if you're above a certain angle or below a certain angle I suppose uh, it will skip off and just disappear uh, I presume it's the one from on top of the vessel if you will it's got like three right and if, however you crash into the floor there'll be two hitting and one going away or, or maybe one hitting and two going away but I'm, I'm gonna guess the other way anyway right now we are setting the alarm for Jebediah Kerman to be leaving the Kerbin system and with that I am gonna say thank you very much for joining me for this adventure ladies and gentlemen I will see you next time where we're gonna to let Jeb disappear out of this area. He's going to go get some sun science and we are going to just see where he ends up after that. And I will see you then when we're going to do that. Bye!